Welcome back to the Market Insights webinar. This is Kevin Prince from BMO Exchange Traded Funds. So glad you could take the time to join us once again and get some insights to the overall marketplace itself. And like in the past, this session here has been built off some of the questions we got from our actual uh, listeners. So thank you for sending your questions in, as well as we'll be answering some individual questions at the end of this session too. So with that, let's get started. Like in previous sessions, I want to quickly highlight through disclaimer, this is not going to be advice and this is not going to be specific recommendations, but we do want to give you individual insights to the overall market and specifically around certain aspects of the market itself. Now, one of our guests today will be the MSCI. Love them to have them back. That's so great. I will note, same thing for them, not market insights and uh, sorry, not recommendations, not advice, but market insights across the board. With that, let me introduce the actual guests here. Danielle from the BMO Exchange Trader Funds and Paul from the MSCI will be joining us today and talk about market insights itself. Now, Paul, you're back from the previous time, so let's jump in to one of the tools you have. And I've had a chance to take a look at the website of MSCI. The last time you were on, you spoke about ESG and the methodology around ESG. And what I wanted to highlight to the listeners here is if you take a look at MSCI, specifically MSCI.com forward slash ESG dash fund dash ratings. I know it's a mouthful, write it down. But I'm really trying to highlight here is if you want to find out the respective ESG score on any ETF in Canada, it actually is now available. And what this will do is it'll actually look through to the underlying holdings of that ETF and then give you a scoring methodology of its actual ESG ranking according to MSCI. Now, full credit to MSCI beyond their research around indexes, they have around 200 people and all they do is study ESG on a regular basis and they work on these rankings. And so for example, here we're showing you one around BMO MSCI. And so this collective weight of the underlying holdings within inside the S&P 500, the MSCI ranks that as an overall ESG rating as A. Again, you can get that on any ETF in Canada. So I encourage you to take a look at that if that's something you want to factor out. Nice tool. Thanks for sharing that with me there, Paul. Kevin, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but your screen is frozen. Could you please unfreeze it? I am unfrozen on my side, Steve. Uh, to the viewer, it's still frozen on the title page. There it is, you're fixed now. Thanks, Kevin. There's the MSCI tool. One more time, thank you for that, Steve. There's the MSCI tool. Again, mscicom forward slash ESG dash fund ratings dash fund dash ratings. And then Paul, why don't you give us first of all a little background for the people who may not be able to join us last time around. Talk to us about who MSCI is and what your role in the overall market is, the investment industry. Yeah, happy to, Kevin, and, and of course, thank you for having me again. It's nice to be uh, to be back on. So, um, MSCI is a, an index company. Uh, we, we do a number of things, but indexing is what we are most well known for. And uh, and this slide shows the scope and scale of our operations. There's about twelve trillion plus dollars benchmarked to MSCI globally, and you can see the breakout between index-based tracking products like BMOs, ETFs, and institutional accounts, and then active products. And, and of course, this conversation is about emerging markets, specifically that $1.3 trillion benchmark to the MSCI emerging markets indexes are the, uh, the largest in the world. It's a space that we truly excel in. Thanks, Paul. Definitely a dominant role in the marketplace. And hopefully the listeners have heard about MSCI before. Now, you're right. Paul already mentioned there that we're going to be talking about emerging markets today. Coming from our listeners in the past about asking about specific questions of emerging markets, we decided to dive into that. And certainly is 
I understand the questions coming in because there's some demand picking up for emerging markets. We're certainly seeing it in the pension fund. We're certainly seeing a lot of news out there. And so that's our really goal today is really give you some insights around emerging markets, specifically MSCI emerging markets too, for that matter. So with that, Paul, let's start talking and diving into emerging markets. Now, one thing you were sharing with me before, and nice slide here, is the changing, changing aspects of, of emerging markets. Walk us through that, please. Sure thing. So emerging markets trace their history back to the late 80s. The, the first MSCI indexes were created in 1988. At that point, emerging markets represented 1% of total market cap. If you fast forward to 2020, at the moment, it's about 10% of global market cap. So it's grown quite substantially relative to developed markets countries. And that has played itself out in a few ways. So two things to focus on on this particular slide. On the left-hand side, we have emerging markets share of global consumption. And again, this is not a surprise because the GDP of emerging markets countries has grown at two to three times that of developed markets countries. And so it really shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that the people who live in emerging markets have more and more consumption power over time. And those local markets are catering to those population bases. On the right-hand side is emerging markets representation in Fortune 500 companies. And you can see how that has just grown exponentially, specifically with China in blue, right? If, if you look at the last 15 years, with the rise of Tencent and Alibaba and some of these other blue chip names that have gotten a lot of press, clearly China has risen to a level on par with the US in terms of representation amongst Fortune 500 companies. So it, there's really been quite a lot of evolution, Kevin, in, uh, in the 32 years that these markets have been an option for investors. So then let's dive in a little more deeper here because I like your bar charts and I know you did some other charts up here. Let's dive into that bar chart and look underneath the hood and do a comparison there of the June of 10 years ago to now. Yeah, so what you're looking at here, so on the left-hand side is the GDP of each market relative to emerging markets as a whole. On the right-hand side is the weight of each particular country in the MSCI emerging markets index. And so this is a 20 year view, right? Looking at 2000 relative to 2020. And, you know, clearly the story in emerging markets over the last 20 years has been the rise of China, right? Their GDP has gone from about 20% of emerging markets to almost 40% of emerging markets. And their market cap has improved by even more. So that is, you know, really the story of emerging markets. The other thing I would point out on this slide, Kevin, is that Korea and Taiwan are considered emerging by MSCI, developed perhaps by some others. As you can see, they have a pretty significant weight in the emerging markets index. And so how those countries perform has ramifications for the index. And oftentimes we get the question about how we classify a market as emerging developed or frontier and you know i would just point out the nuance between emerging market and emerging country there's a case to be made that korea for example is a developed country with great infrastructure and all the things that come with that but in terms of their market and how they treat foreign investors and the accessibility of that market in our view it is clearly emerging and on par with this peer group that you see here. And I know you actually have a lot of consultants and large stakeholders you work with that kind of help, help identify how you classify and categorize those respective countries. So that's um, makes sense. But let's let's take a look in the other perspective now. So you're certainly showing the changes in the country weight-ins and now the dominance of China starting to come into the emerging market space. But let's take a look now, what does that mean from a sector allocation? And you've done a pretty uh, interesting chart up here to share with the listeners. Walk us through this. So this is the same 20 year view that we've been looking at on the, the last few slides. And this is from the sector perspective. And the major headline here, Kevin, is that um, emerging markets, as they have evolved and developed over the decades, 
have gotten into what are perceived to be higher end sectors. And so there's less weight in things like materials and utilities, and there's more weight in tech, consumer discretionary, and healthcare, as you see a rising middle class in many of these countries and more of the private companies catering to the demand of that rising middle class. Yeah, I think you're, which is very interesting to see how that's now changing in the sector weighting, it's certainly bringing a lot new considerations when you're looking at emerging markets. Now, Daniel, let's bring you in here for a second. Um, you've done a nice little chart, kind of a comparison of you know Canada and the MSI emerging market. We've certainly seen the the evolution and the change to in the emerging markets and what the holdings are. And you have your Canada perspective to walk us through the thoughts from a Canadian investor. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so in the past, Canadians have actually always been told, well, you probably don't even need emerging market exposure in your portfolios because emerging markets look a lot like the Canadian market with overweights to energy and materials and financials. But as Paul pointed out, this has certainly evolved. So just looking here at the sector makeups between the MSCI Emerging Markets Index and then the Canadian market, Right away, you notice some big differences, information technology making up 20% of the EM index, and then those consumer sectors combining for about 26%. So sectors which are really underrepresented in the Canadian market. And actually, if I were to put a breakdown up here of the S&P 500, you would actually see that emerging market index, the emerging market index looks a lot more like the US market than the Canadian index. So times have changed, and today I think Canadian investors should have emerging markets on their radar for a few reasons, but sector diversification, definitely a big one. So then let's take a look a little bit too now of kind of the, the correlations, and you did a chart here now, just looking at not just the point of time we did, but more of a traveling view of the last five years and the different aspects of, of emerging markets relative to Canada. Talk to us about this, please. Yeah, Kevin, so this is just kind of another proof point here really to illustrate the increasing diversification benefits of EM equities relative to a Canadian investor. So when you look at the correlation between the two markets back in 2015, the five-year correlation was 0.91, so highly correlated. And when we look at that correlation number today, well, it's trended downward considerably. It's now sitting at 0.78. And when you look at the cumulative returns over the last five years, you can really see how the markets are moving and shifting in different directions and at different times, driven a lot in part by those sector differences and also, of course, the regional exposures as well. So from the lens of a Canadian investor, Emerging markets absolutely can offer more value today in terms of portfolio construction than they did five or 10 years ago. And you're certainly seeing through your chart, an interesting chart, you're seeing that the movements in different directions at different times and the complementary approach of uh, emerging markets with the Canadian aspect. And you certainly saw that also too in your sectors and the weightings here too, showing that the different weights of sectors as a complementary approach. Paul. Let's talk about, we've talked about the, the change in, in the aspects of the weighting, the countries. Talk to us about, you know, relative to, relative to the world markets, valuations, price earnings, and some of those good fundamental metrics. Of course. So, th so this slide obviously is, is the valuation slide. Price to book and price to earnings are probably the two most popular ways of assessing valuation. And as you can see here, the emerging markets index is represented by blue. The MSCI world index, which is developed markets only, is represented by yellow. And I think the major point of this slide is to show investors that emerging markets certainly are not expensive relative to their history, that blue line, as well as relative to developed markets, uh, the yellow line. And so now that they represent such a significant percentage of global market cap, combined with the fact that they're not expensive relative to their history, it, it seems like it can pretty a pretty compelling asset class to uh, to consider. Yeah, 
So then Paul talked about the history. We talked about the transformation. We talked about price, some of the fundamental aspects. Where do you see the future, and MSCI for that matter too, where do you see the future of emerging markets going? I genuinely think it's a case of, of continued evolution, right? If you look at China, for example, they have in the last few years increased their openness to foreign investors. They have changed the way that their A shares work. We have added China A shares to the index, which represents uh, a unique new opportunity set and has obviously increased the weight in China as we spoke about a few slides earlier. So I guess the, the way I see it, uh, Kevin, is that emerging market companies are increasingly accessible to Canadian, Canadian investors. Those companies are growing faster than in developed markets. Those companies serve population bases that are increasingly becoming middle class and have greater demands and pur purchasing power. And so in a lot of ways, all of this is a virtuous cycle, which has clearly led to increased weights of emerging markets in, uh, in, in world global equity markets and more high powered companies. We more high powered companies as we discussed based on uh, representation in fortune 500. And, and so I think, you know, not investing in EM really is not an option in this day and age, given how significant an asset class and an opportunity it's become. Well said, well said. So then let's take a look at it then from a perspective, how do you invest in those? Danielle, there's certainly some choices out there. Maybe you can talk to us about the choices out there and the considerations that they're in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so ETF, just such a great tool for investors to get access to these foreign markets. And, you know, a simple cost-effective trade. The MSCI Emerging Market Index is over 700 stocks training on so many different international stock markets, different time zones, different currencies. So an ETF is such an efficient tool to get access to these markets and to these companies here in Canada. Um, Canadians have a few options in terms of EM ETFs listed here in Canada. So three of the largest emerging market ETFs are VEE, so that's the Vanguard FTSE Emerging Markets All Cap ETF. Uh, lowest, that's the lowest cost option here, so 24 basis points MER. And then two ETFs which track the MSCI index, so that's XEM, that's the iShares one, and that MER is 80 basis points. And then the BMO MSCI Emerging Markets Index ETF, ticker ZEM. So this is actually the largest emerging markets ETF in Canada at over $2 billion in assets. Uh, a cost-effective solution as well of 27 basis points. Uh, and actually, Kevin, speaking to your intro slide, when you mentioned the CPP's growing interest in uh, this space, well, we've seen a lot of institutional flows into ZEM this year. So institutions as well looking to an ETF to get access to this exposure. Oh, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, of course, the trading hours being different and the packaged way of accessing through an ETF. Now, Danielle, you also done a chart here kind of showing the performance here in the of the three and there's a little bit of dispersion between the the the, the, the three of them not now may think of that when you think about emerging markets as a trade so why do you see the dispersion in the two in the three sorry yeah yeah i'll take you through that so you know kevin you and myself and the team we always remind investors to look under the hood not all etfs are the same and the same applies to emerging market etfs so here are the five-year returns you see uh, those three emerging market ETFs that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, some noticeable differences for sure. So the largest difference I think is with VEE. Um, you know, look under the hood, what's that index all about? Do your research. Uh, even though it's the lowest cost ETF of the three, you know, maybe look beyond the, the price tag on that one. So uh, this Vanguard ETF uses a much different index than the MSCI in index, uh, completely different index construction. Uh, it's more tilted to small caps. Uh, and then another big difference is that it does not include Korea. So you can see here the index construction has really impacted uh, performance. 
And then when you look at the other two ETFs, so XEM and ZEM, so they both track the same index, that MSCI Emerging Market Index. So you might expect them to track a little closer, uh, but remember ZEM is a third of the cost of XEM. So XEM's fee is 80 basis points, ZEM is 27, so the fee here really eroding uh, the returns on XEM. Uh, at BMO, we chose to use the MSCI index because we believe the MSCI Emerging Markets Index is really the absolute leader in the space and is really the industry standard. So, you know, Paul sh showed us $1 trillion of active manager assets are benchmarking to this index and then $218 billion in passive dollars. So we believe the MSCI index is just the best way to go for this exposure and investors should accept no substitutes on this one. Well said. Um, let's do a quick little summary before we jump into uh, the questions coming into this week. Maybe Daniel can take us to a quick little summary here. Yeah, so you know what today was all about really, we wanted to get that conversation started on the opportunity set that exists outside of Canada, outside the US. From a growth perspective, it is incredible what other companies are out there, which we just might not be paying attention to as Canadians and Canadian investors. So I looked at the top companies in the MSCI EM index, so the largest companies by market cap. Um, Alibaba, e-commerce giant, kind of like an Amazon in China, it has over 50% market share in China, and that's a co country with over a billion people. So you, do, you can do the math. That's a, an impressive amount of users. Tencent, huge tech conglomerate, um, massive market share in the video gaming space. They own WeChat, the number one messenger app in Asia. And this summer, Tencent actually surpassed Facebook in terms of market cap. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, another name perhaps lesser known. Um, this is the largest semiconductor company in the world and basically established a monopoly in the industry. So with the rollout of 5G phones, that's a, a tailwind for this company. And then, of course, Sam Samsung needs no introduction. I think we all know that name. Uh, one of the largest companies in Korea and the world. So I think as investors, we should have these companies and regions just, you know, on our radar and just be more aware of the global investment opportunities that exist. Thanks for that. Now let's shift gears and let's talk about some questions that came in here. I'm going to reach to Paul first. I mean, Paul, you showed in your questions, uh, in, in the response that in the, certainly that there's a change going on in China and the role inside the index. And really what the question coming in today is, how do you keep up to date with the, the changes that are going on with inside the index? Of course, that cascades the ETF too. Where can I find out information on that on a regular basis? Yeah, so I, I think, as we've discussed, China is the driving factor. It, it has caused more investors to want to do research on China specifically and understand the ramifications and overweights and underweights of China in different sectors. And so I, I would highly encourage people to check out our website. If you go to MSCI.com, solutions indexes, and then fact sheets, we update our fact sheets once every month. And so you get to see the sector weights, the top holdings, the changes in those, performance, risk, anything we're considering in terms of including new companies or, or kicking companies out. So again, um, MSCI.com, Solutions Indexes Fact Sheets. It's, uh, it's available once, uh, once a month with, with very pertinent updated information on, uh, on what markets are doing. And of course, that's available at the EM broader level as well. Thanks for that, Paul. Now, Danielle, one of the ETFs that made a, a deep dive in one of these sessions around, around alternatives, we specifically spoke about ZPay. Again, coming back in for a question for some follow-up here. You know, really more around the pricing and the difference between that and the US dollar version of it too. So we have a Canadian dollar version and a US dollar version of it. Can you talk to us about this, please? Yeah, Kevin. So we chose to launch both series at a $30 NAV. So one is in Canadian dollars and then the other in US dollars. Uh, yeah, so that means that they have different economic values per unit. So since they're a uh, distinct series, like a series of a mutual fund, uh, they can have different prices per unit. It just means if you buy each series for the same economic value, uh, you'd get more CAD units. 
So from a trading experience perspective, the spreads will be similar. The drift uh, between them is just the result of the CAD USD movement since we launched the ETF in January. So while it started at $30, over time, it'll, there'll be dispersion between the two as different currencies and aspects happen to the exact, well, it's the same base, the currency is gonna change the, change the valuation. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Daniel. And then, oh, Biden in market impact. We're certainly hearing lots of questions coming in regards towards the US market. One quick note for everybody, if you want to take a, you know, if you're thinking about the US election and different aspects of the US election and different thoughts and where to position a portfolio, two weeks ago, we ran a webinar and you can get that available on YouTube, of course, take a look at it. And we'll dive into deep specifically on the US election and give you some considerations of different exposure to look at, depending upon how the outcome happens in the actual upcoming U.S. election. So I encourage you to take a look at one of our previous webinars. We cover this topic in detail, specifically in the U.S. election. And then today, the market's very affected by COVID-19 COVID crisis itself. So question coming in around which sector and in which industry was affected the most? Came across a nice chart to help answer this question this week. And the answer is really taking a look at this chart here. And I like the way this viewpoint came in. It's just taking a look at, you know, the change in the forward-looking EPS on one metric. And then the other metric, it's looking at um, change in price at the exact same time. So what you're really seeing here, how does the COVID really affect the marketplace and what's the change in, you know, impact across the board? You're seeing significant revisions down in oil and gas in their um, market. And I think that makes a lot of sense. You've certainly heard that in the marketplace. And then you've seen telecoms a little bit. And you see across your financials and consumers and consumers uh, goods and industrials. Areas that haven't been that impacted by revisions would be like your healthcare, your, your basic materials, and your technology, of course. But then you're seeing on the other metric here is you're seeing the price appreciation across the board for some of those where the technology has not revisioned down, but certainly moved along the way for price appreciation since March 20, since the 23rd of March. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insights of what has actually happened in the marketplace since COVID, but in a perspective of forward-looking EPS relative to pricing. And with that, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, I think that was the last question. Excellent. So next week, look to have you back at this webinar on Friday, October 23rd. I think I gotta update that. Uh, what we're gonna talk about next week is we have on the show, we have the IIAC. Now that's a trade organization. What they've studied more recently is they've taken a look at ETFs in the marketplace and what the role they played in help in helping ease through the correction last time around, what the role they played in that aspect. So join us next week as we start, as we dive into deep around the ETFs and what the role they played in the last correction and look forward to having here one o'clock next week, Friday. Have yourself a good week till then. Cheers.